Hello and welcome to another episode of Conversations with Dr. Westman. Hi, Eric. Good. How are you doing, Glenn? Very good. Thank you. Well, today is a topic that is close to your heart, I know. Uh, today, we're going to be chatting about what causes type 2 diabetes. Um, and this is really uh, what you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, you help folks reverse type 2 diabetes. Um, you have a very particular method that you use, which we'll get to a little bit later. But let's start at the beginning. Um, if someone were to find out um, if they either had, uh, were on their way to type 2 diabetes or they had type 2 diabetes, uh, how would they go about doing this? Right. So you have to understand that diabetes is defined by a high blood sugar, glucose to be more specific, but it's an elevated blood sugar all day long. And it's often picked up on an annual physical. Uh, sometimes you get sick and it's figured out because you didn't realize that urinating a lot and being hungry and losing weight and not feeling well might be diabetes, but that's less common. Most commonly, it's kind of picked up as a you know, doctor will tell you, oh, you know, you have prediabetes. Your blood sugar was high on that blood test. And then, uh, so you need to understand that it's all defined by a blood sugar, blood glucose most specifically. Uh, another test that can be done is called a hemoglobin A1C or A1C for short. And that's just the three month average of the blood sugars. They figured out a way to look at the sugar attached to red blood cells and it, it kind of stays because it's, it's sticky. So if your hemoglobin A1C is elevated, your doctor might tell you you have prediabetes. Uh, prediabetes in most cases will be around for years before full-blown diabetes. And it's all defined by the level of blood sugar that you have. And uh, is it, does it stay high all day long, go up and down? Uh, but first you have to understand that diabetes mellitus the, for sweet, not diabetes insipidus, which is very rare, uh, but diabetes mellitus is a high blood sugar. And um, tell me, Eric, um, you spoke about the hemoglobin A1C, the test that people would do to either determine if they have prediabetes or type 2 diabetes. Um, in the United States, um, I know that uh, different countries around the world have different um, thresholds to be able to fit within in order to be diagnosed as either pre-diabetes or diabetes. Are you able to give us those numbers or do you have them offhand? Well, it depends on the, you know, roughly in the U.S. measurements, it's a hemoglobin A1C of 5.5 or 6.0, where the doctor will start saying pre-diabetes. And, you know, but each guideline has a little different number to, and it changes. So the main thing is that if it's too high, you want to get it down. You want to lower it because prediabetes commonly leads to diabetes. And then diabetes can lead to all sorts of complications that you don't want to have, you know, blindness, heart disease, neuropathy, you know, numbness and tingling in your toes and kidney failure. All You don't want to go down the path of having full-blown diabetes, even with medical treatment today. It doesn't prevent those things from happening totally. So pre-diabetes, you were saying is around about between 5.5 to 6. And then obviously, I would imagine anything over 6, you would already have type 2 diabetes. Is that, is that am I correct? You can use those as rough numbers, yeah. yeah. And so, Eric, in your opinion, where does it all begin? You know, what is the root cause of type 2 diabetes? Do you think it's the guidelines? Do you think it's, you know, obviously some people, um, for example, you could have someone that, that eats a particular, the, the standard American diet that never, ever gets type 2 diabetes, yet someone that, that eats the standard American diet gets type 2 diabetes. Yeah, well, so it's complicated, right? Uh, depending on the individual's metabolism, you can handle carbohydrates or you can't. Uh, so we call that carbohydrate intolerance. So you're intolerant of it. Um, and some people are carbohydrate intolerant, others aren't. It might even be in the family. It's a difference because one of your parents had it and the other didn't. So that can be quite confusing. But in a keto world, a low carb world where you've um, reached your 
you know, optimal weight and metabolism, there is no diabetes. So, which leads me to the fundamental conclusion that it's carbohydrates that cause diabetes. And let's say, wait, carbohydrates are sugars and starches and they get digested to glucose and you absorb them as glucose. So it makes sense that if you ate something that had glucose in it, your blood glucose would go up. And it, it really, um, <laughs> Uh, it mystifies me why the medical community is so entrenched into not believing this. I mean, my patients who are instructed in this, it's obvious. They say, well, why would I want to have an apple when it raises my blood glucose and my blood glucose is already elevated? Right. right. That's exactly right. So um, the root cause uh, now, the, there are individual differences, but um, most often diabetes is accompanied by obesity. And obesity causes something called insulin resistance, which is from carbohydrate intolerance. Uh, but diabetes is not always with uh, obesity, which complicates it a little further. Uh, so, uh, but the good news about a low carb or, or any effective weight loss program is that you fix the weight and you fix the insulin resistance and you fix the diabetes all in one fell swoop. So I'm a big fan of, of lifestyle approaches, including keto, to address diabetes and obesity if they're together because it handles all of it in one fell swoop. So all of it gets better. Now, um, type two diabetes, um, uh, it's my assumptions, my uh, understanding is a progressive uh, illness. Is that correct? <laughs> no. No, it doesn't have to be. <laughs> so, um, yeah, well, to, this is one of the reasons why the medical community is mystified and, and doesn't understand what we do, is that, yes, in their experience, it's always progressive and all that, because people don't change what they do. Well, the doctor isn't always, well, the doctor rarely advises you to make radical changes in your diet to fix the diabetes maybe they've never even seen it happen. So there's a whole clinical experience and clinical world that my world of using low carb keto diets where we've seen diabetes reversal, meaning it's not progressive. So, but you do have to change what you're doing. You know, if you, uh, but if you are interested in, yeah, maybe I don't really want to have diabetes. Well, who, who would want it, you know, then, Consider these other options because, uh, it, and what's amazing is not a, it's not that difficult. It's just getting the right information. And um, uh, it, again, the my fellow doctors, even in my own Duke community, have never seen it, so they don't think it can happen. And then they think what I do, uh, you know, it's so extreme for people. No, actually, it's not. So they don't really understand the world we're in where we do see diabetes reversal and diabetes is not necessarily progressive if you make changes. So Eric, I know that you've been doing this um, in your clinic. Is it now 12, 13, going on 12, 13 years now? You've been treating your people for type 2 diabetes and obesity? Yeah, and yeah, but the research studies go back 20 years now. It's kind of hard for me to believe when I first got involved in, uh, you know, because of a patient of mine who followed this approach, I was curious. And after about eight years of research, we opened our own clinic at Duke. And yeah, we've been seeing this happen. And, and uh, I've treated people with lots of different medical issues as well. So there's a medical monitoring piece to all of this that's really important. If, if you have diabetes and you're on medications, they need to be reduced almost immediately in most cases. So I highly recommend uh, that you see a doctor or health practitioner who understands how to take you off medicines. It's called de-prescribing. But you know, the first world conference on de-prescribing just happened this last weekend in Vancouver. It was a, a, a virtual conference, but a lot of doctors don't know about it. They'll just assume you're always going to have diabetes. You might even have heard that. And, and that's just, uh, you know, I don't know the right thing. It, it, it um, at times it, it breaks my heart that people don't know that there's another way to do it. It uh, sometimes aggravates me that 
other doctors are just perpetuating the the failure that people feel, you know, oh yeah, you'll never be able to, no, we, we actually can make it simple and make it work for just about everyone. Um, and then of course there's the, um, why would doctors not know about it? Well, they get educated by companies that sell drugs. And uh, so that's really what we've been taught to do in the medical world is to treat diabetes with a drug. So, you know, stepping back, if you're uh, diagnosed or you're told you have a high blood glucose and pre-diabetes, you may be offered, oh, don't worry, just take this medicine. No, that's not the answer. I mean, it, it's a, a uh, um, managing the, the approach rather than fixing it. And, uh, and there are, you know, drugs being advertised on TV with, with jingles with them, hearkening back to songs when I was a child, they've renamed the, the words and um, uh, they want to make you, you know, we'll manage your diet. No, you don't want to manage diabetes. You want to fix it. You want to reverse it. And the language is interesting. The um, Federal Trade Commission in the U.S. gets a little bent out of shape if you say cure diabetes. So we say reverse and, and fix or some other, because there are a lot of people who say, who claim they can cure diabetes and they can't. They're just trying to sell you another substance. But um, uh, so yeah, it, um, more and more people come in and, and uh, are telling their friends and neighbors. And, and once doctors understand what I do, they start sending me their patients. And that's why there's such a long waiting list at, at my clinic door, unfortunately. So Eric, you speaking, you've spoken about medications um, and you've also spoken about deprescribing medications. So let's um, try and understand that or unpack that a little bit. So I know that you're hugely successful with your method that you uh, use um, at your clinic. Give us a, a typical example of what you would see in your clinic with someone that comes in, you know, typically a person that's on medication. How quickly can they, can they either be weaned off that medication or, 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 or reduce that medication? What's typical? Yeah, I guess let me start with the uh, kind of minimal medication. So you've been diagnosed with prediabetes. You might be on a medicine called metformin uh, or, or another oral agent. It's called just one pill. Well, those go away immediately. You change the diet. You don't need to take those pills. They're, they're very weak. Well, they're treating the food <laughs> and changing the food is much more powerful than those medications. So if you have just a mild prediabetes, you've only been put on one medicine, that's simple. It's gone, first day. Um, if you've gone down the, uh, so even then, don't take the medicine if the doctor's offering it, change the lifestyle. You won't even need the medicine. So I guess that's going back one step further. Um, now, worst case, you've been going down this path of medication treatment, management of diabetes, you've gained weight. Uh, a lot of these medicines cause weight gain. The, the pills and especially insulin causes weight gain. So I've had people on you know, four shots of insulin a day with these new other shots that are once a week and pills. And if the blood sugar is in the kind of normal range, I need to reduce the insulin immediately or the blood sugar will go too low. And, and I'm not talking about an, a, a 1%, 2%, it's 50% reduction in insulin on the first day. So this is called de-prescribing. And I explain to people what's gonna happen and, and um, they are, have to check their blood sugars before taking insulin because the blood sugar might go too low even on the first day. So you have to understand the medicines are kind of adjusted to the carbs that people eat. The more carbs you eat, the more medicine you need. If you're on fewer carbs, then you need less medicine and we help people reduce that. Um, some exciting programs and I'm keen to learn myself because uh, they've now become available uh, inexpensively to use a continuous glucose monitor the first week or two so that people can see their blood sugar every five minutes. So it takes away the, the fear, the worry, the concern. You know, often I, I'm the new doctor that they've met for the first time and or twice, and I'm going against what their doctors that they've known maybe for 20 years have said. And so there's a, a worry, a concern, a, a, a 
you know, I, I work really hard to show exactly what's going to happen to make sure people are measuring uh, because when you're measuring the blood glucose, you're really in charge of managing the medicine as well. And yeah, so I, my record is uh, taking someone off 180 units of insulin in two days. Wow. And looking back, you know, I ask people what they eat and drink, but often I'm not told everything. <laughs> so looking back, this individual was drinking sugar sweetened beverages, you know, a liter or two per day. And so the insulin was treating the, the sugary drink. And when he stopped consuming the sugary drink, he stopped the insulin. And the, the proof was in the blood sugar. So another way to put it is the amount of sugar that we eat and drink is massive when you compare it to the blood sugar level. The blood sugar level, you know, you get a number, it's 100. Well, this is in milligrams, 100 milligrams. And, and when you eat an apple, it's 20,000 milligrams. Wow. You know, it's 20 grams, but, but a gram is a thousand milligrams. So uh, you, we're, we're just pouring, consuming. I mean, we've been accustomed to this, to always, oh, don't worry, it's not anything. No, these are big deals to a, a blood sugar system that has milligrams of sugar. You need to be really careful if you have diabetes to not have grams, you know, let alone hundreds of grams over the course of the day. Uh, so, you know, I, I try to explain the biology of it and to the level that someone wants to know, but measuring the blood glucose will help people get off the medication often, you know, the first day or two, uh, a week or two. Now I've had people who are uh, in a program where they've had to lose 200 pounds. They have diabetes as well, and they might still be on insulin a year later. So the ultimate fix for diabetes is losing the weight if weight is the contributing cause to the diabetes. So what's great about a keto low carb diet is you cut the carbs out immediately, the blood sugar goes down and, and you also lose weight if that's partly the cause for, uh, of the diabetes for you. So it's a really kind of unbelievable approach because it really fixes the short-term blood sugar rise and the long-term obesity contribution to the diabetes. Now, Eric, I want to make it um, clear to people that are watching um, the importance of being monitored by your doctor um, before, you know, trying to implement this diet on your own, because a lot of this medication that you're speaking about can be very, very dangerous if you, if you embark on this sort of program and you keep the same strength or the same dosage of medicine. Um, do you want to just touch on that before we, before we start moving on to some questions? Right. So just to clarify, I think this is healthy eating for anyone if you're not taking medication. You know, but if you are taking medications, especially diabetes and high blood pressure medicines, they can become too strong very quickly. And so, yeah, do not do this if you have those diseases and you're on medications. Otherwise, I think this is just healthy eating, just to, to clarify that. And before we get going with the questions, Eric, if someone wanted to learn your method, how would they go about this? Well, there are a lot of ways uh, to lose weight and to fix these problems. I, my method is based on uh, lots of teaching I learned from different doctors who had done this for years. And then we published our results in medical journals over the last 20 years. Uh, and then we've taught lots of different doctors to do this in their clinics. Um, so currently, of course, adapterlife.com and Adapt Your Life Academy is a way to learn more about how to do keto very simply. Uh, I put up a, a drwestmanonline.com so that people can get inexpensive resources. Uh, but again, do it with a medical supervision if you have these kinds of medical issues. Fantastic. Well, let's move on to some of the questions that people have. Uh, I've got a question here from Martin and he says, um, he has been a type two di uh, diabetic for over three years. Um, and he's always been told to eat between 45 and 60 grams of carbs per meal. Why is this? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> um, the recommendations to eat carbs um, developed over kind of a slippery slope of now that we have medicines for diabetes, let's let people eat 
like normal people, meaning bread and all those. Well, first, that's not necessarily normal. <laughs> and, and normal doesn't mean optimal. But so what happened, if you look back in the 1900s, when insulin was developed, and then these other pills and products, the medical world kind of lost its brain in terms of the carbohydrate contribution to diabetes. And so uh, in order to make it so you don't have low blood sugars on medicines, you're taught to eat carbs. Let me say that again. You're taught to eat carbs so that you don't have low blood sugars when you're on the medicines that you don't need in the first place. Oh, did, did I say that? Yes, of course. So this, if you go down the medicine pathway and, and you know, it's as if the researchers in diabetes got um, derailed by the worry about cholesterol in the blood. And it's a difficult story to tell briefly. Gary Taubes' book, Good Calories, Bad Calories was in, quite influential for me, uh, pioneering work to tell the story of how this all got messed up. And so you're basically taught to eat carbs so that you won't have low blood sugar from the medicine that you need to treat the diabetes that's from the carbs in the first place. Crazy. Okay. <laughs> that is crazy. But um, okay, next question. Lucy asks, folks with type 2 diabetes are at greater risk of cardiovascular disease. If I eat more meat and fat, won't my risk profile for cardiovascular disease go up? No. And that was the surprising result of our research 20 years ago. And it's been replicated over and over and over. So it's not the fat in the food that causes the fat on the artery that we were all taught. I know I was taught that too. It turns out that there's something called metabolic syndrome. So that if you look, it's the carbohydrates and sugars that cause metabolic syndrome, not the fats in the blood. So I have no problem using this in someone with heart disease, pretty much any medical issue with monitoring um, and not to worry. Uh, again, the, the book, uh, Nina Teicholz's book, The Big Fat Surprise, Gary Taub's Good Calories, Bad Calories, will tell you the story of how this all got messed up. And even scientists got, um, medical doctors got uh, distracted by the worry about cholesterol in the blood. And that's still probably the most um, significant medical barrier for doctors to understand this and to use it. Uh, last question we have from Arlene, and she says, um, more of a statement, actually, I've been following Dr. Westman's method for over three years. I've lost over 80 pounds. I'm no longer on medication. My blood pressure has normalized. Thank you so much for showing me that this can be done. Fantastic. Awesome news. Eric, before we go, um, we got some exciting news, obviously, uh, as uh, some of you may or may not know. Um, you've actually got a step-by-step -step method that's going to be launching uh, very, very shortly. Um, it's going to be called uh, the Keto Made Simple Masterclass by Dr. Eric Westman. Uh, I know this is a step-by-step -step method of how to implement the program the right way um, with all the myths obviously busted and uh, just doing everything right the first time. Uh, I know that's going to be available pretty soon. If you would like to learn more, please uh, go on to adaptyourlifeacademy.com. Uh, and then uh, if you like this video and would like to see future videos, you can find us at uh, our YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram accounts under the name of Adapt Your Life. Um, please be sure to hit the notification bell to be alerted every time one of these videos comes out, which is typically on a Wednesday every week. On behalf of Dr. Westman and myself, I want to thank you for joining us again for another episode. Um, Eric, thank you so much for your time. And uh, I look forward to uh, next week when we uh, cover some more interesting topics. Well, thank you, Glenn. I'm already getting positive feedback from the, you know, if you subscribe at the Adapt Your Life Academy, you get emails and tips. And I'm already getting great feedback from those tips uh, that you get on, in the weekly newsletters. Uh, so a lot of free information there if you just sign up. Thank you so much, Eric. I really appreciate it. Till next week. Thank you. If you like this video, you're going to love our Adapt Your Life Academy. So click on the link in the description to find out more.